Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. It's one o'clock on a Monday afternoon, so you must be watching Think Tech Hawaii, Research in Manoa. I'm your host, Pete McGuinness-Mark, and every week we bring you research experiences from the Institute of Geophysics and Planetology at UH Manoa. Sometimes it's geophysics, sometimes it's planetology. And boy, have we got an exciting show for you today in a slight variation. We have a guest who's a remote location, so I'm very pleased today to introduce Dr. Milton Garces who is a researcher within the Hawaii Institute of Geophysics and Planetology. But Milton has his lab on the Big Island, so he's joining us live via scope. So welcome, Milton. Hopefully the weather over on the Big Island is just as uh, good as it is here at Manoa. Um, and you're talking about something really exciting, as, these, as far as I can tell. You're going to tell us about infrasound. So tell us a little bit about infrasound. What is it? Hi, Pete. Well, good to be here again. Uh, I'm kind of building on a previous presentation, um, uh, kind of escalating uh, the, the level of detail that we can do with the tools that everybody has at hand. So we're learning how to collect the geophysical data, the scientific data, with cell phones. Um, and uh, to understand how we got here, I'm going to rewind back to some of the natural sources of very deep sound, which is infrasound. Uh, infrasound is sound that is generally below the hearing threshold of us humans. However, it's been there from the beginning of time. Uh, and uh, it's also there it's from the moment of our conception, uh, the heartbeat of our mother, the breathing, the respiration. There are all these long period cycles that are part and parcel of our daily life that create sound, and we call them for sound. So um, the audience has probably become quite familiar with the idea of looking at different wavelengths of light into the infrared or the ultraviolet. What we're talking about is the audio equivalent, wherein we're hearing frequencies which our ears aren't susceptible to, and that unlike an old person like myself who loses his high frequency hearing as he gets older, Infrasound, which you study, is at longer wavelengths, so it's a lower frequency than what we can actually hear. Yes, so it's a deep vibration, and uh, at a certain point um, in, in pitch and frequency, we lose our sense of tonality. And what sounds like a long period of tone starts sounding like a beat. And well below that, it turns into a sensation. If something is loud enough and deep enough, you feel as a physical displacement, as a movement. Uh, and so even though we are sensitive to very low frequency sound or infrasound, we sense it differently. Okay, and so uh, there's a whole spectrum of frequencies. You can presumably study different phenomena. You're sort of a physicist, a geologist, an engineer. So can you tell us a little bit about which kinds of phenomena you can study using infrasound? All right, so we're going to put our, uh, our infrasound goggles on. So like you pointed out, it's equivalent to all of a sudden we can see into the infrared. So let's pretend we can hear into the infrasound. Um, and some of the sources that we have, um, I don't know if you have that slide up. Yes, yeah, so if we have the first sources. slide, I think. Ah, uh, here we go. And for the, uh, the, the listening audience, we've got somebody on uh, a, a large wave surfing. We have in the middle top um, something I think is related to tsunamis. Top right is um, an air burst, probably for a media uh, coming into the atmosphere. Right. And then down at the bottom left is a volcanic eruption plume. Um, bottom right is a hurricane. So you can study all of those phenomena with infrasound? Yes. And so um, starting on the left hand uh, side, with uh, that is Chopu, which everybody knows who is in the uh, extreme surfing arena. It, it is a fairly insane wave. And what we learned uh, from our studies in Hawaii was that the, uh, the infrasound that comes from breaking waves scales not necessarily with the height, but at breaking intensity. How hard is this wave breaking? And usually, if it's large, it breaks harder, but mostly 
it's how hard is hitting the shelf? How hard is collapsing up, up on itself? And one thing we found out, for example, is the pipeline it is like the perfect infrasound radiator, which when you look at it, you realize this thing's the nastiest thing. And so it, it all makes sense. So surf, anybody who is in the business of chasing waves can hear it the night before. It's going to be big tomorrow. Everything starts ringing. Everything starts resonating. Some of that is the ground, but some of it is infrasound, you know, with that distance in the, at the sound. Okay. The and presumably it's not just pipeline, which is important. You could also be studying yeah. uh, the, the regular surf uh, along the beaches yes. in Hawaii. So even small breaking waves, as they crash either on the beach or they break offshore, would they make infrasound signals as well? That's correct. And so the, the bigger they are, the meaner things are. In general, the rule is the deeper they go. So this is something that, that, that's going to be recurrent. The bigger it is, the meaner it is, the deeper it is. All right. So it just so goes lower and lower. The other examples, you know, like that huge volcanic eruption at bottom left on the screen or uh, yeah. a, a meteor coming into the Earth's atmosphere, they may, must make very striking um, sound waves as they uh, enter through the atmosphere. Yeah, just taking the wave analogy to, to the other extreme, you have the Tohoku earthquake and tsunami. And uh, we had an infrasound signal, that giant wavelength, I mean, the scale of the atmosphere that arrived to Hawaii five hours before the tsunami. is essentially an acoustic precursor to the tsunami wave. Which so would give an us an early, early warning signal if we uh, had, it, it was. had an array of instruments. Now, um, do you just have regular microphones for this kind of work? Uh, the second slide shows some of the toys I think you've built. Can you uh, just explain yeah. some of the things which we're seeing in this illustration? All right, so you're looking at the, the infrasonic things. Uh, and, and this is, on the left-hand side are some of the equipment that we have traditionally used to record infrasound. And uh, they consist of a, of, of a microphone, a low-frequency microphone, which doesn't kind of look like your microphone unless you, like, zoomed in with a microscope. Right. And yeah, our like, sound okay, crew here in the studio are scratching their heads saying, that doesn't look like a microphone to me. Absolutely. And part of that has to do with... Uh, the the scale of the sound that we're trying to capture is on the order of tens to hundreds of meters. Okay. So <laughs> yeah, it, yeah. It occupies a lot of space. So these things are minuscule compared to the scale of the sound we're trying to capture. And, and do so you put them out in the field or have them in a, a lab or what, what, what's the deployment strategy you use? So on the left hand side, we have the, the, the cylindrical things are the sensors, and then the more square things are the things that turn it into bits and bytes. And then we deploy them, uh, not necessarily as single stations, although we can do that, but as conglomerates of elements that are coherently, like we have two ears, and that helps us find directions. If we have more than two ears, we have four ears, we could tell heights much better. And so we deploy them as of sets of sensors that work together to be able to tell direction of arrival of a sound wave. So essentially, with our sensors, it came from the right, it came from the left. And you would put these sensors tens of meters or kilometers apart or on different continents? What, what's the spacing that you need? So we would put them on the ground, uh, on the surface of the ground, listen to the atmosphere. Uh, although some people put them in balloons and some people put them in all kinds of strange places. But the concept is you uh, design the separation based on the scale of the sound you want to capture. So if you want to capture smaller scale sounds, it will be on the order of tens of meters. But if you're trying to uh, record a clandestine nuclear test at distances of 2,000 kilometers, which a lot of these things are designed to do, then the distance between each element is on the order of kilometers. So you end up with a very large aperture to scale with a very large sound. All right. So it would be comparable to, say, a radio telescope that astronomers might use or a seismic mm -hmm. array that a geophysics person might be studying, earthquakes, that sort of thing. Yeah. So, so these are uh, adaptable aperture telescopes that you have multiple elements. It's the same idea. You're looking at sound coming from, different, from the same place at different stations and then putting it all together again. Now, on the right-hand side of that same figure are our new toys. These are toys that are essentially Internet of Things capable. And uh, one of the things that we are 
developing our cell phones, smartphones, right. for data collection. And uh, we just got lucky. They've been performing very well. For and I think we'll, we'll get back to the cell phones uh, uh, in the second half of the show. Um, I think the third slide actually shows us what some of your data look like. And um, it, yes. it doesn't particularly matter. We're looking at sound waves, it says, from the Huku. <laughs> but can you explain all the nice colors and what the yeah. scale is on the left-hand side, we're seeing not yep. one frequency of sound, but many, is that correct? Yeah, this is the part where I put my expert goggles on and I look at this data, and, and it's, uh, it's what we call a, an, an expert rendition of the same wiggles that you'll imagine. On the bottom panel, you can see that there's a little black line, and that's what you will get from any sound file. So you have an MP3 and you put it on your recorder and you see wiggles, it's like, oh, cool. Yeah. Well, the very first wiggle, that you see there on the left hand side with that with the sharp onset, the first color that you see, uh, that corresponds to a seismic wave that came from the uh, Japanese earthquake. And so, uh, and, and the whole first stage in there on the left hand side of the figure are, are earthquake waves arriving to Hawaii from Japan, and different paths that they take to the different layers in the earth. And so. That earthquake was so big that it shook here in Hawaii, and the microphones, well, they're moving up and down, and that gives you a pressure differential. So, so we can record seismic. On the horizontal axis, we've got time. Yes. Early on the left, yes, late correct. on the right. Yes. And then the colors, might they be intensity? Um, they tell you direction, they tell you the speed of propagation, they tell you uh, a number of variables that, uh, that give you reassurance that this is legit, this is a real <laughs> signal. And that means that all the sensors are playing well together, and they're all telling me this signal is coming from Japan, and it's moving this fast. So it helps us, it's almost recognize seismic waves from acoustic waves. So on the left-hand side, early in time, the seismic waves get here fast. Boom, here, here they are. Later in time, this massive infrasound wave, I mean, the, the, the scale of this wave is from the Earth's surface to the upper atmosphere. The, the whole, there is a wall of sound, right. literally, coming at us from Japan. And this thing arrives very deep and rings for a very long time, and it moves at the speed of sound. Your typical tsunami moves at 200 meters per second, sound moves at 340 meters per second. So it essentially outruns the tsunami and gets to us and says, hey, this thing really went off. So that's our second. Our so second that, that, I think it's, yeah. that tsunami advance warning, um, it may not tell us exactly it's heading straight for Hawaii, but it would at least give you an understanding of the magnitude of the event? It, it will tell you something wicked this way comes. The magnitude of the earthquake will probably be cut from the seismic, but what the infrasound tells you is like, we had a really big displacement in the atmosphere. Right. As you know, if, if plates rub against each other, the displacement is horizontal, not vertical. This is a measure of how much it moved vertically. All right, and we've had both Gerard Fryer and Rhett Butler on the show previously talking about tsunami risks to Hawaii. Um, your infrasound data, would they be available in near real time, or does it take a lot of computer processing to understand what it is that they're telling you? Well, it takes about um, an hour per thousand kilometers. So if you're looking for a way, um, it outruns the tsunami, but there's still a time that it takes to get here. Um, and part of recognizing the signal is knowing that it's there. When this happened, we've only seen this type of signal that clear twice, which was from Tohoku and then from Sumatra. So we first discovered it in Sumatra with the same network, global network, and then this is the second time we see it. That being said, um, there, there are groups in Japan who are deploying a system to use infrasound for early warning, and it's much closer to the source. So some of the data that is here is available to the Pacific Tsunami Warning Center, for example. Okay. So they have access to it. And so they will be the ones who get to choose, is this useful to us? And then, if necessary, then we can develop our product for that. Right, but it's another alternative technique whereby we can perhaps get a better understanding of the severity. But let me stop you here, Milton, because uh, we're getting near the mid-show break. So let me just remind the viewers, you're watching Think Tech Hawaii Research in Manoa. I'm your host, Pete McGuinness-Mark, and my guest today is Dr. Milton Garces, who is a researcher also in the Institute of Geophysics and Planetology. And Milton's at his field site. Uh, he's on the Big Island for joining us via Skype. And we'll be back to Milton in about a minute. So see you then.
Hello, I'm Dave Stevens, host of the Cyber Underground. This is where we discuss everything that relates to computers that's just going to scare you out of your mind. So come join us every week here on thinktechhawaii.com, 1 p.m. on Friday afternoons. And then you can go see all our episodes on YouTube. Just look up the Cyber Underground on YouTube. All our shows will show up. And please follow us. We're always giving you current, relevant information to protect you, keeping you safe. Aloha. Aloha. My name is Mark Shklov. I am the host of Think Tech Hawaii's Law Across the Sea. Law Across the Sea comes on every other Monday at 11 AM. Please join us. I like to bring in guests that talk about all types of things that come across the sea to Hawaii. Not just law, love, people, ideas, history. Please join us for Law Across the Sea. Aloha. And welcome back to Think Tech Hawaii, Research in Manoa. I'm your host, Pete McGuinness-Mark, and my guest today is Dr. Milton Garces, and we're talking about infrasound, sound waves which our ears cannot hear but tell us lots and lots of geophysical information. So Milton, um, as we were talking about the tsunami, um, it became clear to me that it would be really helpful if you had lots and lots of your toys, your sensors, spread out around the planet. And I'd like to pursue this a bit more in the second half of the show, because I believe you were hinting that we could use our cell phones to do this. Can you explain? Yeah, I'm, I'm going to dedicate this next, next little origin story to Margot, because she asked me once how I came up with this, and Margo I didn't have a good story. That's right. right. <laughs> so um, one of the slides that showed earlier was uh, the Russian meteor, the Shelly yeah. Shelly Abings meteor. Right. That thing was massive. It's about a you know half a megaton of explosive yield equivalent of detonating over Russia. And it made a lot of people very nervous. Uh, the closest infrasound station was part of the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty's international monitoring system. It was in Kazakhstan, 600 kilometers away. And the signature was loud and clear. Over the next day, that ex giant explosion from this monster meteor went on the world not once, but twice. And uh, we started all oh, got very excited about this. Uh, we don't get, we don't get a, a something like that very often. It's been the biggest fortunately, fortunately, <laughs> at least fortunately, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's kind of nerve-wracking, you know. This is a an ex secret Soviet facility, right? So yes. imagine that uh, there was a moment of tension there. And so um, uh, when I looked at the waveform, the uh, the Nexus spy had just come out of Google, and they had a barometer in there. And I looked at this, and I looked at that, and I said, hey, and, we could have picked up this signal with a cell phone. And this, this, is, th this is just a, uh, an illustration. Presumably, this is stylized, or are these real data that you're showing us on this cell phone? Oh, no, this is real. Uh, so this is, real. This, this is live. and. Uh, you can go to the App Store or the Play Store and type Infrasound, and uh -huh. you can essentially get an application that will record Infrasound for you. And if you have a barometer in your smartphone, you can get both the microphone data and the barometer data to record Infrasound as, as deeply as you want. And while we don't so, do any advertising, I see Redfox. I believe you're associated with Redfox. Is that correct? Well, the chain of this uh, was, uh, so we, we, we came up with this idea, and I was like, well, can we do this? And then the Accelerate UH is a University of Hawaii effort to try to commercialize um, uh, University of Hawaii ideas and technology. So they said, hey, you should form a company. So we were the first class of the Accelerate UH, and we found the red box out of that. And so we essentially worked with UH to bring this thing to market and, and try to come up with different ways of applying it. So now we have Android, now we have iPhones. Uh, recording infrasound, and this is all part of the whole University of Hawaii ecosystem uh, that's to try terrific. to find a path to commercialization. Yeah, because you know, one of the things which the university is trying to do is to create new jobs and businesses within the state of Hawaii. So Redfox was initiated by the University of Hawaii, and uh, you've developed this app, and what do you do with it? Oh, there are so many things to do with it. It's, it's actually kind of funny. <laughs> So, um, do you have uh, the next slide, please? So, if we go. So, these are. So, this is uh, one of the existing global networks, and um, if if you look at it from this scale, it looks pretty dense. But when you drill in 
to the details, this is actually fairly sparse. There, there's always a need for more sensors. And these things do tend to get rather expensive. So we're trying to find a way that we can create a network very quickly using whatever everybody has in their hands, which is smartphones. So um, we're looking at a map of the globe and all the different symbols, whether they're green or red or blue. Um, some are already in place, but all of these would look like uh, the set of toys you showed us in your second slide, wherein we're basically oh building pieces of hardware as one-off kinds of instruments, and then you have all the data which you have to uh, contend with. So this particular network consists of four different types of systems. It has um, seismic, underwater acoustics, it has uh, infrasound, and also gas monitoring. And all these things are cohesive, in a sense, for this network, but they're all sparse. So if we want to build a more dense network, we have to wait for adaptable ways of doing it. So we're trying to supplement these beautiful networks that exist out there already by finding ways to do it on the fly, as needed. Basically, like you will fire up Google Maps to find out where you want to go. And this is a way for us to collect data very quickly. And I bet your cell phone app actually uploads the data or you can find them on a website or, or something like that. So. Is this a, a, a current capability or something you're trying to build for the future? So let's, um, let's go to the next slide and talk a little bit about the uh, SpaceX Falcon Heavy. All right. Here yeah, we got yeah. a nice but, NASA photograph of the launch a few weeks ago. <laughs> it, was, it was a gorgeous, gorgeous thing. Uh, it's one of those things that at least makes me proud to be a human being, that the fact that we can not just launch something into space, but do a, a synchronized ballet landing of a... Uh, right. And this must, this, this must make a, a, a large noise, not only uh, right in uh, uh, Cape Canaveral, but um, around the surrounding area, I would guess. Yes, and um, we did not know how this was going to play out. As you already know, the initial odds of success for this was about 50-50. So we deployed as if it was going to pay, maybe not really all go smoothly. And imagine if that had happened, that would have been something else. As it turned out, it went up very smoothly. Uh, all the power was distributed very evenly along the trajectory. So it made a sound that was actually not as loud as it could have been, had thing gone to miss. So this is actually a, a very beautiful launch. Uh, we pick up the, la the takeoff and then the landing of the first stage. So if you go to the next slide, and you can see a map with little cell phones. And your website, uh, redfox.io, is that correct at the bottom? Yes. Okay. That's correct. I'm sure some of so our viewers will want to log in and check it out. So if you download the app and start recording, the data will go to redbox.io and start processing automatically and become part of the whole community. And so what you're seeing there is a crowdsourced network. These are all people who have cell phones, turn them on, and so I'm just running for the background and then recorded the whole launch All and right. landing and, and the red star uh, on the island off to the right-hand side, just north of Cocoa Beach, that was the launch site. And yes. um, the difference in the colors between the green and the white cell phones is? It's Android versus iPhones. Okay, so it works on both platforms, which is great. And what did yes, you hear? Sorry. Well, if you look for the last slide, and, and again, this is one of the things that I'll just explain with some, with some right, details. Let's take a look. Yes, okay. What, what, what do we have All here right. in this slide? So I'm showing you one of our first test units. This is an iPod Touch. It's not even a cell phone. It's a music player. <laughs> so <laughs> it's a, essentially, it's a music player that has a, has a microphone in it, and it's sitting over 20 kilometers away from the launch site or quite a ways away, and what you can see in that figure is uh, time on the horizontal, yep. and on the vertical, on the lower panel is the waveform. Again, if you have a sound file, you will see the waveform. And the time is in panel, minutes, is that, is that right? The time is in minutes, yep. that's correct. So it takes a while for the sound to get to 20 kilometers away, and then what you're seeing is the whole launch sequence. It, it turns on, it goes off, it vanishes, and then later, you see this little spike that show up as a high intensity yellow. Yeah. And on the third panel red, those, it, that's the reentry component. That's when the items start coming back down on Unbelievable. Earth. Unbelievable. And then 
the grand finale over there is that double entry. And somewhere in the tunnel over here, there's that core stage that hit the ocean at Mach one half. Uh-huh. <laughs> so, uh, but, but that's no, a little bit more advanced digging. Yeah. If you're a SpaceX engineer, for example, there must be an awful mm-hmm. lot of technical information which you could pull out of that kind of infrasound sonogram, for want of a better word, because you mentioned you know, had it exploded on the launch pad, it would have had a different acoustic signature yes. from whether or not it was working correctly and would you even be able to tell say if there was one of the boosters which wasn't quite functioning as well as the other two um, you know when my car's not running properly I can hear that it's not happy is the same true for the infrasound signals um, I would think that that would be the case, and I would hope that the SpaceX engineers have a good set of microphones laying around the launch pad to record the performance um, variables on this. I doubt that they will share that with us, but if they wanted to, that would be most fantastic. But, but this would be a great uh, <laughs> capability that you could provide to either SpaceX or to NASA or anybody else. Uh, you, know, you don't want to go into the field and have a whole array of instruments which then get fried as the rocket goes up. But infrasound, <laughs> you can stand off 10, 20 miles and still pick up these signatures. That sounds, you know, something that your company might be particularly interested in. Who knows? If you think of uh, volcanoes and inverted rocket that never makes it, then right. that was the original premise for volcano monitoring, essentially. Just step away from the monster. Don't get hurt, don't destroy your equipment, and then record from a distance. And so the beautiful thing is that we have never built a rocket even half or a fraction of as powerful as our big volcanoes on Earth. Those are the yeah. nastiest, biggest things. And we pick up those signatures anywhere on the planet now uh, because they're, they're so deep and so clear. So infrasound is incredibly diverse. You know, you've just shown us that you can study surf breaking on the ocean, on the coastline, or tsunamis or volcanoes and then you closed with uh, infrasound of a rocket launch. You know, there must be many yeah. other applications. So as we draw to the end of the show, Milton, you should come back and tell us some more about one of the other applications, because I know you've spent a lot of time developing this instrumentation. Um, you know, would you be wanting to come back some other time in a not too distant future? Of course we do. Oh, it's terrific. Well, I'm afraid we've come to the end of the show. So let me just remind our viewers, you have been watching Think Tech Hawaii Research in Manoa. I've been your host, Pete McGuinness-Mark, and my guest today has been Dr. Milton Garces, who is a researcher within the Hawaii Institute of Geophysics and Planetology. And we've been learning just a little bit about the fascinating field of infrasound. So hopefully we can get Milton back sometime in the future. Until then, join you again next week. Goodbye for now.